Welcome to episode 11 of the Rosenthal and Jesselnick Vanity Project. RJVP. This is the part where Anthony says something totally crazy. You tell him I'm coming and hell's coming with me. I've got a plus one, right? <laughs> Energy in the studio is good today. Anthony's feeling fresh. I don't know what it is. It's the new year, and you're kind of – it's like you're in boxing shape or something. This is 2016, Anthony. I mean, I have been working out for months, training, training for this podcast. Uh, so I am, I'm feeling good. I'm looking good. I've got a lot of energy. You got, you got some motivation with the new year. That's right. That's right. Ready to prove people wrong. I'm uh, highly motivated to strangle this year to death with my bare hands. Uh, my only revenge is success. <laughs> is what I keep yelling in my sleep. Um, I, I'm excited. I want to ask uh, happy new year. First of all, a uh, happy new year to all our podcast listeners. Uh, I want to ask Greg. I know that, you know, Greg's wife, Emika is, uh, is Japanese, like off the boat, Japanese, like couldn't be more Japanese. That's Totally she, not true. She grew up she in Orange was, County until she was eight and went if to she English was, schools her whole life. If she was any more Japanese, it would be offensive. Uh, so, And the, ja the Japanese people, a lovely people for the most part, uh, have a lot of traditions for New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. Yeah. It's like a big thing. So I'm, I'm interested in what you had to do. I asked you, like, what are you doing? And you, did, first of all, did not invite me to any of the things. So I assumed that it was kind of like a family thing. Like no, a, you could always like come. We family. just assumed you wouldn't want to go. That's true. There wasn't a lot of planning ahead. I knew you didn't want to necessarily get up the next morning, which is part of it. So, you know, the night before, mm -hmm. uh, there's a traditional meal, some soba noodles. Very good. You know, nothing crazy. Uh, is, I mean, is that it? Like just soba noodles? Because I've had those. Yeah, it's nothing crazy. There's some other stuff. You know, little stuff that like goes, like what? Like this is what I'm interested in. I want to know the de the details. Well, I don't like, really, I don't, don't really know things. the night before because you know part of the reason Emika gets probably annoyed is we've boiled it down a little bit. We've got a couple kids where you know we had to run to the grocery store, the Japanese market that on New Year's Eve because we hadn't had time to do it by then. It's already you know run out of a lot of things, and you know she was upset about that. So we have to go to another market try like to what find. What were they missing things. that she was upset about? Well, there's these ginger, these little swirly sort of cake cake things and that's what you have on new year's morning so that's that's really the big meal you wake up on new year's morning and you have a breakfast slash brunch i guess but pretty much right when you wake up they've got these fermented like or not fermented sorry these... when, you say, when you say breakfast slash brunch you mean brunch yeah okay. well it really is breakfast you got some sweet beans that that like cook and marinate for 24 hours my you know emika ellis loves this our daughter ellis loves those you've got these sort of cake things with swirl on it now i'm gonna get made fun of by anyone that's japanese and definitely my wife for not knowing what these things you're not are. supposed to know there's a soup there's a soup kind of a, a certain type of uh chicken soup that that you have uh there's all sorts of things you know i think in japan and when we first started doing it there it's like an array of 12 13 things now it's maybe you know we've got the kids and everything it's boiled down okay some i don't know it's i mean good though. all i heard was sweet beans and i was <laughs> I, the sweet beans sounds dope uh so that and, and so after that after like the breakfast thing after the brunch is that it or yeah we, there's no other traditions no, like, on new year's day there's no like ritual sacrifice if that's what you're getting at i don't i don't mean a ritual sacrifice i know you guys save that for easter <laughs> but i uh i just i'm interested in in how you guys do it i know there's like lucky numbers like when you guys got married yeah you had to get married on a certain day because it we was... had a friday wedding because saturday that particular week and the, that month of that particular year was really bad luck mm-hmm yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just, I'm just interested. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a fun uh, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. Did you guys like have champagne, or did you uh, like a midnight? We stayed up. She stayed up. Yeah, we stayed up. We stayed awake drank and a little bit and watched. Watched the ball drop. That's about it. I mean, we watched Netflix and then switched it to the ball about five minutes before. You... Watched. Uh, you watched Thoughts and Prayers. You watched my Netflix special well, on New Year's. <laughs> We've watched that every week, actually. That's awesome. Uh, everyone should uh, Thoughts and Prayers on Netflix. Uh, again, that was the reason that I started doing this podcast. Um, and it's been it's been so long I forgot it. Um, I had kind of a f I had a fun New Year's. I went to uh, I went to a party. Uh, my friend John Mulaney uh, mm. had a, had a had a party. I had to dress up. 
Another uh, person with a special on Netflix. I know you don't mm-hmm. like. That's right. No, uh, he's he's the. Uh, I I'm very proud of John. He's the second best ble- second best uh, special on Netflix right now. Uh, very funny. Uh, it was a fun party. We had to dress up. We had to wear suits. And I, I squeezed into one of my suits from Last Comic Standing, which was like months ago. And I thought, oh, this will totally fit me. And uh, it was, uh, I felt like, uh, I felt like a sausage. Oh. I felt like squeezed so in. So that's why we've got the motivated Jessel. Like no, it's like, I'm, I'm jacked. It's like, it's all muscle. Oh. You know what I mean? It's not fat. It's all, it's all muscle. You're looking at me like you're skeptical, jealous. Um, I had a, I had a fun week after New Year's. Uh, I went up to uh, me and me and Raj, me and uh, Roger Goodell. We uh, we went up to the uh, Federal Wildlife Preserve in Oregon. Uh, <laughs> really? And, uh, and just hung out. You know, we had a, a, a Roger, uh, Mr. Goodell, as I like to call him, or as you should call him. He's your boss. You know, he's got a bunch of friends in the militia. We ate chili, had a couple of beers, and just kicked it. You know, kicked it hard. A lot of high fives. He's a high five kind of guy. Uh, and then, oh my God, this, this is like maybe my, the thing I'm most excited about about this podcast this week is, you know, it was week 17 on, uh, on Sunday and I won a bunch of money. I was in a, uh, I was in a gambling pool, uh, all season long mm. and it all came down to week 17. And I, if I was in second place, I would have won $400. Wow. I came in first. I came in first and won $1,800. That is a big difference. $1,800 in Second place is 400. I couldn't do that, of course. You're not allowed because I'm an NFL employee. There's no gambling, but that's that's crazy. It's a head-to-head competition uh, where there's a tournament. Really, you know, you try to pick all the games right all year, and then it's almost like a fantasy league where there's eight teams left, eight guys, and you're picking against them. And you got to the finals, mm-hmm. and it's close going into the last Sunday, and it comes right down to Raiders Chiefs. Chiefs favored. By seven, and it's crazy that that big difference, fourteen hundred dollar difference, comes down to the Raiders getting a last minute garbage touchdown backdoor cover that wins you the money. That's right, I won the money. That was little Wayne. That was great. Let's do what was cut. I'm so hyped. That song like describes me how I feel right now. It is That's night and day, Jesselnick, this week compared to last week. Oh, yeah. Last week I was ready to quit. Uh, this week, this week I think El Nino has supercharged me. Uh, what was cut? Uh, this is a fun what was cut because it, these are things that we've been talking about for weeks and trying to get under the radar, uh, but we keep on getting them cut out. So let me do, let me do my best, uh, which is, again, extraordinary. Uh, one of the things that was cut, these are all, these are all going to be Goodell related. These are all things that I said Goodell did. So let me try to now describe them without getting them cut. Uh, I said that someone um, played music, a.k.a. scored a famous football player's funeral. I said that we were talking about the song 59 Miles to Jacksonville. Classic. Uh, the unofficial soundtrack of RJVP. <laughs> I know I'm in a good mood when that doesn't drive me up the wall the first th- time you play it. I, I said that someone, someone who was involved in the making of that song, in order to get that certain singer to sing the song, or and she wanted the job and she had to do things to get the job. I think I got, I think I got by. Uh, a thing that, a thing that got bleeped, uh, this is Greg. This is all Greg. Uh, Greg, there's a, there's a uh, nickname people say for people if you are kind of a, uh, like a jobber. I think you would call someone. It's a football term, too, for uh, the type of player that wouldn't even make a roster. He's just there in the summer. Okay. He's not, gonna, he's not even going to make the team. He's just okay. a slapstick. Is, uh... A slapstick, only, only instead of stick, you throw a D in there. Uh, slap Nixon, I like to say. Uh, we had a, um, a G-O-D dam situation. Uh, you're allowed to say, damn, you can't throw a God in front of it. That's what makes it blasphemy. And we can't have that here at the NFL. Uh, I think Greg, no, I threw an F-bomb in, uh, last week. I threw an F-bomb. Um, and then I had a someone, a certain someone, we described him doing, doing an R&B song and that the video 
was like the video of D'Angelo, D'Angelo, where he's he's not naked. You described the, him as the, one of the three black people I knew. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Them and then one of the guys from Tribe Called Quest, and then Lil Wayne. Uh, those are the three uh, that he did a video for the song. And he wasn't wearing any clothes, which I thought was a ridiculous image, but we cut it uh, to save Greg's job. Um, and then we had to cut a whole swath uh, from my predictions, where I kind of went on a rant about about JC. Uh, the J. Christ, as I like to call him. I was describing, you know, his appearance uh, and his ethnicity uh, for quite some time, and that was all cut. <laughs> and then uh, we really had to take an axe to tweets from my girl, Miko Grimes. Shout out to Miko. Uh, Miko had a lot of gr uh, tweets about uh, Tannehill that were uh, extremely, uh, extremely offensive. Yeah, it included um, some sexual acts. Although I really wasn't happy when I listened to it, Brandon, our producer, that he cut out one of the tweets. I think it could have been left in there that included getting some reporters the same. You know, they he was, she was going to go at the reporters um, with Magic Johnson's Johnson. I think we can say that and give okay. give them. Um, okay, yeah. There, I mean, there were the things I've got listed in. here are basically like a body bodily fluids, uh, just the one, but it's different like different words for them and then uh, of course referencing magic johnson and that was what was cut that was dmx classic that was impressive anthony what was you just killed that the did i was did edited? i get through it all the way yeah awesome what, what if we could have a show and if you're a new listener to the show every show we go through what was edited out of the last show before we start our world famous headlines what if we got through a show and it didn't have to do anything what was edited is that like the ultimate no, ending no I point no i would consider that a failure okay. if we didn't if i didn't push it too far like if i don't if i don't get something bleeped out i feel like i haven't done my job you know what i mean it's your job to try to keep it on the rails it's my job to uh, to get this train right off, I want. I'm I'm looking at a death train. <laughs> Touchdown, Airbud. Well, let's Could get. Not have been more appropriate. Let's get to those headlines. I thought you wanted to talk about the gift. Oh, that's right. We should talk about the two songs that we've listened to so far. Yeah, that was not an accident. We didn't just pick those out of a hat. Greg, explain. The only two songs that we can use in this show before we have to go to NFL approved, NFL programmed music mm -hmm. and we don't know what those songs are going to be the nfl songs they're just from the nfl library they could have been produced or performed by anyone we don't know but i when I, once i hear it i know i know who it was and i'll try to describe it as best i can but the first two songs are songs that were featured in a in a book that was sent to me from a loyal listener of rjvp my uncle dave who sent me a package and it's probably going to be the last package i've ever i ever get in my life addressed to Greg Rosenthal of RJVP. Why do you have to be so negative? It's the new year. I'm excited. And you know, you got to say you're not going to get any more packages okay. addressed to Greg Rosenthal of RJVP. That would be cool if I did. And it's a great book, The Rap Yearbook by Shea Serrano, former Gra Grantland writer. It goes through each year since hip-hop started and picks the definitive rap song of that year, explains why, has people arguing for, against it, why it's such a great song, why it's important, was going to be the present I gave to you for your birthday and Christmas, but it wasn't in the store, and so I never did. So now it's perfect. Now it's it's sent to RJVP. Are you trying to get credit for a present that you wanted to get me? Well, I'll let you borrow it or whatever, but people should check out the book. Shout out to Grantland. Shout out to Bill Simmons. Greg and I will see you in heaven, Bill. <laughs> okay, uh, first headline. What is it, Greg? Tom Coughlin retired this week after... Another. No, he didn't retire. You're wrong. Oh, that's that's true. He stepped Designed. away from the New York Giants. I'm blowing it already. He he stepped down as the head coach of the Giants. Certainly, some question whether he was forced to do that. Believe that you know he clearly was. Uh, it sounded like he wanted to still keep coaching, but it was an emotional day in New York. He had been there for 12 years, and he had a press conference packed to the gills with players reporters, a hundred cameras. He was, if you don't like Tom Coughlin, this this press conference might make you like him. And you kind of can see how well he can command a room. It was very emotional. Him saying goodbye to all his players and, and his friends and everything like that. And Eli Manning, of course. Well, I love, I mean, I love Tom Coughlin. He won two of the greatest, uh, what, what, what Steelers fans refer to as the greatest non-Steelers Super Bowl victories. <laughs> 
uh, for sure. Uh, won both of those, uh, taking down the Mighty Pats. One of uh, those was my first Super Bowl ever. So you're mm -hmm. so that's what, that made it even better for me. <laughs> I was uh, I was very happy uh, to uh, to to see that happen. Uh, my favorite part of the Coughlin press conference was when uh, he talked to Eli Manning, and he uh, Eli got a little emotional as Coughlin was leaving. I think Eli kind of blamed himself, and uh, and Coughlin Coughlin talked to him a little bit, talked to Eli directly during the press conference. Play a clip of that. It's not your fault. All right, it's not your fault. <laughs> see, that was I mean that that was great. He talked to him for just a couple seconds, and then later on he talked to him again. Uh, reference began. It's not your fault. All right. It's not your fault. <laughs> really, really emotional stuff. Um, Eli was crying. Uh, full blown, full blown uh, Obama Newtown tears uh, up there. And, uh, and it was. Again, one of the things I don't like seeing from quarterbacks. Mm. You're allowed to cry once as a football player, and that is when you retire. And even then, I'm not, I'm not thrilled about it. But watching him cry during a press conference was a little, a little upsetting. Uh, play, one, you know, play one more clip from the, at the very end. It's not your fault. All right? It's not your fault. <laughs> it, yeah, it just it, kept... Those all sound similar, but trust me, they're all very different. It was very emotional, and it, it was bad luck for Eli that the Associated Press camera got right up in his face because he was sitting in the back, mm -hmm. and yet there's this video online that the camera's right on Eli's face, and his lip, you can, like, see it quivering like, He's trying not like to crazy. Cry. A lot of like people in our newsroom thought that was a really genuine, cool show of emotion that made that endeared Eli Manning to them, but not you because you're heartless. It, you know, I'll tell you, it endeared me that he tried to hold back the tears, that he did his best. I like that. Like, the lip quiver, if you lip quiver and that's it, awesome. You show a little emotion, but you don't go too far with it. You know what I mean? People don't cry. And I'm not saying men don't cry. I'm saying people. When I see women cry, I get a little mad. Like, get it together. Get it together, ladies. That's uh, pretty much the Anthony Jeselnik uh, guide to life right there. Like, don't, don't, let, don't show too much emotion. Never. They'll, show, they'll see you crack. <laughs>
will you just comp this whole night? And they said, that's not how the economy works. You don't just get to say, listen, I don't feel like using my card. Go ahead and comp me. You know what, the other, what else is great? Oh, Billy. Is, is his, yeah, is his, he asked people to call him Billy, which was great. That just can't be comfortable to wear a disguise all night in Vegas. I wouldn't want to wear a hat in Vegas all night in the club. You know, he, he had to have been kind of miserable. I'm sure he regrets it now, but he shouldn't. Because now I hear that the Cowboys want him. The Cowboys want to get him, and they should want him. He's a master of disguise. Well, take it a little further. If he's going to go to that much trouble to hide it from the team, then why do you not show up the next morning for a concussion protocol? That's how this whole story really came out. By the, by the end of the night, Peter King is reporting it on NBC that he missed the concussion protocol, that the Browns want nothing to do with him. And oh, by the way, he wants to play for the Cowboys. So Jerry Jones is now saying, yeah, we would take a chance on some troubled quarterbacks, just you know, speaking vaguely because he knows he can't talk about Manziel. So Manziel, this is all part of his master scheme to I mean, go to the Cowboys. Yeah. It, maybe he's smarter than you think. Well, I mean, he, it's not as if he had shown up for that concussion protocol if they would have been like, oh, welcome back next year. Like, thanks for, thanks for fulfilling all our dreams by showing up at 9 a.m. <laughs> so that we could have you sit, uh, sit in the locker room. I don't blame him for that uh, at all. And if I did blame him, he would have redeemed himself with the disguise. <laughs> That was Roger Goodell. Uh, Goodell didn't actually, he didn't play the song. It was kind of, uh, I forget the name of the band, but it's featuring Roger Goodell. And the video, if you remember, is a DJ. And in front of the DJ is Roger Goodell, and he's swinging glow sticks. He's swinging them around, uh, and he's wearing a disguise very much like Johnny Menzel's. <laughs> this next headline is my second favorite uh, headline of the week, and this is uh, Big Ben, Big Ben Roethlisberger, uh, my quarterback extraordinaire, reacting to fans in Cleveland, uh, like fa Steelers fans in Cleveland, cheering when they when they heard that the Jets lost. The Pitt Pittsburgh needed the Jets to lose to get into the playoffs, and they needed to win, and they were already winning. There's about a minute left in the game, two minutes maybe, and Ben hears loud cheering going on behind him. Loud cheering. The Steelers fans famously travel very well. There are a lot of Steelers fans at that Cleveland game. And uh, the quote from Ben is fantastic. They said, Ben, what did you think when you heard all that cheering? And he was confused. He said, I heard some cheering. So I looked and assumed it was a fight. A Steelers fan beating up a Browns fan or something. <laughs> and that's the whole quote. That is amazing. That his first reaction to hearing cheering in Cleveland Stadium is to imagine that Steelers fans are beating up a Browns fan in their own stadium. <laughs> That's how far it's gone. That's how far it's fallen. It's been a tough uh, run for the Browns here lately. The worst. The last uh, five coaches that have been fired by the Browns. First of all, the last five coaches to lose their jobs in the AFC North have all been Browns coaches. So the Ravens, the Steelers, and the Bengals have all had coaches, and the Browns are going to be on their sixth. You know, second of all, at this point, every time the Steelers play them in week 17, they fire their coach. All five of those coaches were fired after facing your Steelers. Absolutely. They're, they're basically the harbinger of doom. We're the coach killers, uh, the Steelers. Uh, they're the opposing coach killers. Uh, yeah, Cleveland has had a rough go of it. But I think if there's one silver lining, it's that they still have Johnny Menzel on the roster, and he's like having two quarterbacks. <laughs> Touchdown, Air Bud. <laughs> that was Roger Goodell's brother. He has a brother who also plays music. And if you know Roger, he likes to surf. And he asked his brother, he said, would you, would you learn a little Dick Dale and play something for me while I'm surfing? And his brother said no, and then eventually, eventually did it. And that's what that song was. I don't know what it's called. It's pretty good. Very Dick Dale-like. Mm -hmm. Very Dick Dale-like. So the Browns uh, made a big move this week. I don't know if you're aware of this. They made a big front office move. Very surprising. They hired an executive I, from baseball. I did hear this from the Mets, the Mets vice president, right? Paul De Podesta. Mm -hmm. So they literally went and hired the guy that was Jonah Hill's character 
in Moneyball. That that is Paul De Podesta. They kind of changed it around significantly and, and just made him a different guy in that movie. But essentially, they hired the guy that was Jonah Hill to run their entire football operation. And people are questioning this move. They're saying, why would you hire a baseball guy? Here's the Browns. Here's what the Browns were thinking. Here's what Cleveland was thinking. The first offer they made was not to De Podesta. The first offer they made was actually to Jonah Hill. Wow. And they couldn't afford him. Jonah Hill turned him down several times, and they said, well, what's the second best thing? What can we do from here? Should we try to get Michael Sarah? We can't get Michael Sarah. Mm. Let's get De Podesta. Let's get the guy that he played in Moneyball. Who is next on the list? After Michael Sarah? <laughs> uh, the kid who played McLovin? <laughs> I was thinking that, too. <laughs> I was going to make a mint plast joke. Great minds. We're 59 miles to Jacksonville. <laughs> Driving together between the lines. You and me on I-95, 59 miles to Jacksonville. Wow. That, for long-time RJVP listeners, you know what a treat that was for me to hear. Uh, Brandon told me when I walked in the studio that I had a surprise coming and, and nailed it, really knocked it out of the park. Uh, and I, you know what? I like that version a lot better. I haven't been a big fan of the song, but when I heard that one, and that was clearly, if everyone knows, that's Johnny Cash. Uh, playing. Um, he recorded it just just a year ago, uh, but excellent, uh, excellent song. And I kind of, I kind of dig it. It's kind of changed the way that I feel about Jacksonville. If if an R, if a Rosenthal and Jesselnick vanity project RJVP <laughs> listener is out there, and they can show us proof that they are 59 miles to Jacksonville at that moment, maybe some sort of street sign. Yeah. I don't know. We'll we'll give you something. Well, uh, we'll have your, we'll have Greg's uncle send you a book that you're supposed to get me for Christmas. Uh, next headline. Let's talk about the Bills fans and just give them a round of applause, really, for the amazing season that they've had, giving us so much enjoyment every week. Bills fans doing something crazier and crazier. We've talked about it on the show, and for Week 17, the big finale, a Bills fan lit himself on fire. After jumping on a broken wooden board. Uh, uh, no, it's not a wooden board. It's a ch they, they jump through tables. That's like their big thing. <laughs> the guy jumps through a table that's on fire. They set the table on fire. Then he jumps through it. He does like a back slam. His back is on fire. The guy runs away and then runs back to the table. He's still on fire. So is the table. And then they put out the fire with beer. They pour beer all over him. Every single person in the video, and there are dozens of people in this video, they are all laughing. <laughs> Everyone is enjoying this poor bastard on fire. Uh, it, is, it is great. And I what I love about the Bills, not only did they take out the Jets, which I really needed this week to get into the playoffs. Uh, if the Steelers were That's not in the playoffs, I might, not, yeah, I might not have shown up uh, if, uh, if we didn't make the playoffs. If my season was over now, I'd be, I'd be pretty upset. Um, but uh, I like that the Bills have picked it up each week. You know what I mean? It starts with like a table slam, and then it's like a guy slamming a guy into a table. It just keeps going and going. That I love it. And, uh, and sorry, my cell phone's going off. I'm blowing up. Probably got a job. Nope, it's my sister. It's probably Goodell. Um, oh, maybe Goodell's with my sister. That would explain a lot. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> that would explain a lot. I like to know what the Bills fans are going to do next year. Oh, good point. To top this. After you slam yourself through a table on fire and catch on fire and have your friends put you out with beer, what's next? Like, Greg, what do you think is going to be the, the thing next year for the Bills fans? Well, the craziest thing they did this year was really a lot of uh, sexual acts. So maybe, maybe they could light themselves on fire while in the middle ooh, of a sexual act. Ooh, light themselves on fire and then put their hands on each other's pants? That Something could be like – that, yeah. that would keep everybody warm. I think if I'm going to – and I don't think I'm talking out of school here – public beheadings. <laughs> that was the Gadets. The Gadets. Roger Goodell tried to put together a girl group. Uh, if you if you follow the show uh, Empire, uh, you know they're always trying to put together girl groups, and uh, it's kind of it's kind of ripped from the headlines of Roger Goodell's life. He tried to put together the Gadets, and they just couldn't get it together. You know, it's 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 four women. Their periods sync up, and they just start going ballistic, <laughs> and they can't they can't get it together in the booth, and it just didn't it didn't work out. Uh, so the Gadets, that was their only song, their only song. You actually you just described the uh, plot to uh, Sisterhood of a Traveling Pants three. 
Is that a thing? <laughs> That's what happened. That... I don't know. No, but I do want to tell you that uh, <laughs> I once heard Emika, my wife, uh, laughing in the other room, and then I, I kind of walked over to find out what it was. And it was you making the joke about Roger Goodell and the Gadets. <laughs> really? <laughs> she just loved, she just loved that, that image. Is this not the first time I made that joke? Have I made it before? You, yeah, I think you called them that at one point. Mm. I mean, they, they've, they've helped out earlier. Their music was on an earlier program. Yeah, I forgot that he, well, he fronted a group. He fronted them for a little while. And then when he tried to let them do like a spinoff, do their own thing. Yeah. He was like, I'm busy uh, surfing. Then, then, it, then it all kind of fell apart. Uh, it's tough. Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receiver Mike Evans was ejected from last week's game against the Panthers for disrespecting an official. Disrespectfully addressing. Yes, which has official. never been done before. Have you? Do you think this has ever happened, that a player's gotten ejected for disrespectfully addressing an official? When, when you brought that up to me, I thought, sure, that happens all the time, but that really only happens in... Basketball, basketball constantly. Yeah. Baseball, you know, if you yell at the officials, you you never really see it. And they even football. give you and in baseball they give you they give you some rope. You've really got you've really got to pull on that rope to hang yourself in, in baseball. Basketball they're a little more ready they're willing to give it to you because everyone knows what you said on the court. But in football it's unheard of. It is unheard of. And here's what he said. Here's what he said that you can hear if you really play the audio, and this is going to get bleeped for sure. There's no way around it. He just says, I don't know what the ref says to him. I think he's trying to get a flag for pass interference. It's, it's uh, Mike Evans is a wide receiver. He's trying to get the flag, and the ref doesn't give it to him. The ref says something to him, and he says, you know what, ref? I don't give a f <laughs> Boom, flag, gone, ejected. Which makes me think, and then the referee has to say, he has to get on the mic and say he's being ejected for disrespectfully addressing an official, which is the weakest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. It's like he's the most sensitive referee in the world. He's the most sensitive referee since Billy Crystal from Forget Paris. <laughs> <laughs> A movie I've never seen, but I remember the commercial and the trailer. Do you guys remember this? I'm looking at these no. kids in the booth. No. Who are way too young. Sydney's back there, uh, who produced uh, an episode a few weeks ago, of course. She's been hot That's on Brandon Pale. Fam. We now actually bring her to watch each show just to make Brandon yeah, feel make pressure. Sure. Uh, they're 15 years younger than sure. us, or I something know. like that. I know, and it was it was like the, it was like Billy Crystal's movie. No one remembers that movie. I don't remember but that movie. I remember it existed. But do you guys remember the movie? What was the one with Meg Ryan? Uh, which one? Which I've never seen. Did he? Did, he just did the one with. Wasn't Meg she Ryan. in Forget Paris? When Harry Met Sally. When Harry Met Sally. He did go. When Harry Met Sally. It was a huge hit. I've never seen that. But then a couple years later, he tried to like recapture the magic with Forget Paris, and he plays a basketball referee. And I only remember the commercials because there's a terrible scene. Where and this is like years after Kareem Abdul-Jabbar retired, but he's on the court and he he throws out he te he uh, tees up Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and kicks him out of the game, and Kareem says, "But it's my farewell game." And Kareem is an amazing actor, as we all know. He says, "But it's my farewell game." And Billy Crystal, with a big smile on his face, says, "Well, let me be the first to say farewell," and with a big smile, as if people wouldn't lose their minds if you kicked Kareem out of his farewell game. Uh, Billy Crystal, way too sensitive to be a referee. <laughs> And that's why, that's why no one respects him to this day. <laughs> that was Roger Goodell, uh, obviously. You guys, I mean, you, if you guys have been paying attention, you know, you can kind of tell his style. That was a song, remember when Alanis Morissette was huge? He, his biggest goal besides becoming NFL commissioner, was to write a song for Alanis Morissette. And he kept sending her that almost almost every day. Uh, it was The song was supposed to be about, the lyrics were going to be about Uncle Jesse from Full House. As we all know, You Ought to Know was about Uncle Joey. This was going to be about Uncle Jesse and her <laughs> conflicted feelings for Uncle Jesse on Full House. But he never got the lyrics together and never worked out. But the, the song, the song lives on. The song lives on like the brandon and sydney behind behind the glass are pretty like do you even know you ought to know by alanis morissette of course. yeah okay of you course. never know that's that's sydney's ringtone <laughs> it is it is you nailed it edited because that was so 2015 
That was Goodell again. That was Goodell's early stuff. That way he tried to get that. Uh, that well, that was a rejected uh, opening credit sequence from Saved by the Bell, the college years, uh, when he worked in television in the beginning of his career. Not a bad song. Uh, not a great song. I think what they ended up going with for Saved by the Bell, the college years was even better. Mike, again, that was also by Roger Goodell. Bob Golick in that in that series. A lot of people, you know downplay that series because it's not as good as the original you know the saved by the bell but bob golick in that series is incredible i wasn't just a big like saved a great bell performance guy. i wasn't a big saved by the bell guy i was dukes of hazard or gtfo uh this uh our last headline of the week is uh, something everyone's been talking about uh especially brian urlacher uh brian urlacher famous uh bears uh linebacker one of the best bears linebackers of all time and that's saying something has hair all of a sudden for the first time in his life. Yeah, he came out and he essentially was a promoting uh, a group that you know regrows hair, and he had this big reveal while he's you know sponsored by this this local company. It doesn't seem like it's some big company in Chicago, and he basically hit the airwaves in Chicago, all the local radio, local television, so that people can see his hair, and it looks completely insane because you've never seen him with hair and it looks you know like astroturf essentially no i think i disagree i think it looks good like if you had never seen him before you'd be like oh that's normal hair and if he was like i'm brian erlacher's brother you'd be like okay i see what's up because erlacher always shaved it he wasn't like going bald you never saw him with kind of like a like a balding kind of thing like so you just assume that, that person if they do that is bald <clears throat> why would you do that otherwise what do you mean don't you just assume everyone that bicks their hair is bald? Yeah, but it's like this. Like if you if the first time you met me, I had long hair like down to my shoulders, you wouldn't you wouldn't think thought anything of it. But if I walked in now with hair down on my shoulders, you'd be like, what's going on? So the first time you see someone, that's the thing where see, knowing him the way you've known him your whole life, that's why it's weird. But I think the hair actually looks good. It looks pretty natural. But my favorite thing is the quote, the quote that he gave on one of the news programs. Erlacher says, "I know I look a little better." A little better. He's promoting this thing. They gave it to him for free. He says, I know I look a little better because I was going to a fancy restaurant one day and I had my hat off by accident. What does that even mean? <laughs> I was getting food and this girl goes, you look like Brian Erlacher, but he's a lot older looking than you. Ooh. First of all, that never happened. <laughs> and he says, this was when I had hair. She goes, you look a lot older than you. I was like, you're right. Thank you. So basically she was telling me I look kind of young. I love that he tells the story and then has to sum it up at the end. Uh, Brian Urlacher, uh, pretty good hair. My, I've got a theory about this, Greg. What? That people that use the word fancy restaurants usually don't go to fancy <laughs> restaurants. I bet the people who use the word fancy restaurants only take their hat off by accident, <laughs> air quotes. Uh, I, I wonder if it really was Brian Urlacher. Could have been Johnny Mans. Life goes on and on till midnight comes around. <laughs> Sailing through the rivers of my mind. That was me. Wow. Yep. That was me. Now it's time for a segment. Loyal RJVP listeners know that we do this every single week. It's one of my favorite segments. I know it's Greg's uncle's favorite segment. It's time for. Who's, Who's had, had sex? On Christmas Eve, Carolina Panthers quarterback Cam Newton and his girlfriend Kia Proctor welcomed a brand new baby boy into the world. Chosen Sebastian Newton is in perfect health and weighs 9 pounds 6 ounces. And you know what that means, Greg? They had sex! <laughs> Oh, that's a uh, lifelong dream. That was uh, that was who's had sex. Uh, you know what, Greg? Let's take it to Recommendation Station. <laughs> Sit back and enjoy the ride. 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 What is that from? It sounds like it was sounds like it was evidence used in a trial. <laughs> it was an album that had a woman bending over what? with just bottoms and it looked like it was a, a thong of sorts. But you're talking about the, you know the official 
NFL licensed, approved in house music that we are forced to play yes. because we're no longer allowed to play commercial music. That was one of the songs. That might just be our new theme song, or maybe just play that in between every single headline. Honestly, it made me uncomfortable, that song. <laughs> it made me very uncomfortable. It's hard to do. I can't, I, that song, how excited were you when you found that song, Brent? So excited. So, so excited. It is, uh, it is, it is unethical. It is over the line. It's, it's a great. Li- it's a little two faced that the NFL supports programming and music like that while they're not letting us do our thing. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, recommendation station, Greg. Last week was a fiasco for you. Uh, try not to recommend something that we would have read in sixth grade and then talk about it for weeks. I'll stand two. by Anne Frank all day long, <laughs> but I won't recommend it this week. It was a great book. Top 10. Uh, Billy Lynn's Halftime Walk. It was a football show, so I'm going to um, give you a book and a movie that's football-related. Billy Lynn's Halftime Walk. It's really a post-war book more than it is a football book, but it all takes place at halftime of a Cowboys game. Check that out. Uh, it's, I've heard great things. I, I own it. I have not read it yet. It's really it's really amazing, and there's a Jerry Jones-like character in it, which is really interesting. He just captures a lot of stuff. And then uh, the documentary I wanted to – uh, recommend Undefeated from about three or four years ago. I believe it was nominated for an Oscar. Maybe my favorite sports documentary of all time had me in tears in the theater. I'm not uh, afraid to admit. Just like an, it, you know, it was a low level movie, but it, it got picked up in a few places. Ended up getting nominated. It's unbelievable. Undefeated. What's it about? I haven't seen it, but I know I've seen the post. It's basically one of those high school, you know, okay, season in the life high school football team that means so much to the town. That that type of thing. You've seen stuff like that. Are before. they the Tigers? Or yes. I'm thinking about, was it was Basil and Tigers, but okay. it's not Go Tigers. It's the same. It's the gotcha. same town, I believe. Okay. Now I'm messing it up. But that's it. I was thinking of Go Tigers. Th- those are those are good recommendations. Very football related. I'm just going to talk about things that I that I'm reading right now and that I've seen lately. Uh, the book I'm reading right now is a great book. Uh, if you guys are listening to this podcast, it's not for Greg. You know, what I mean, let's let's be real. It's not because of Greg. It's because of me. So you love comedy. This book came out maybe like a month ago. It's called The Comedians. It's a nonfiction book. It's about the history of comedy. Uh, in, in the world, I guess, but it's, it's, it's basically in America, but America, America is the birthplace of stand-up comedy, uh, for sure. If you hear any comic from outside of the country, they suck, and you can take that to the blood bank, Senator. Uh, it's, it's, it's full of great stories, it's a great history, and really funny, interesting stories that just, like, crack me up. Like, well, I'll tell one of the stories, uh, Shecky Green and Buddy Hackett were best friends and huge drinkers, and one day in Vegas... They, they, they're hanging out, they're drinking, they're getting wasted in the middle of the day. I think it's like 10 o'clock in the morning. And they're walking across the street. And Buddy Hackett always had a gun for some reason. He was always carrying around a handgun. And they're walking across the street. And Buddy Hackett stops in the middle of an intersection. And Shecky Green keeps walking and goes, Shecky, you know what? And Shecky turns around. He's like, what? He goes, you're a Waldo. And Shecky goes, what? And he goes, you know what? You're a double Waldo. And Shecky Green says, I have no idea what that means, what a Waldo is. But I know you shouldn't say that to me when I'm drunk. So he runs over, punches Buddy Hackett in the face, takes his gun and his car keys and throws them into the desert and then runs away. <laughs> and hours later, Buddy Hackett calls him on the phone and says, Shecky, it's Buddy. Uh, you know, if people were with us this morning, they would think we didn't like each other. And they went on being friends. And I love that. You're a double Waldo. Uh, so that's the book, The Comedians by Cliff Nesteroff. I'll spell his first name, K-L-I-P-H, Nesteroff. I don't need to spell that, you know. And then this movie that I saw, uh, this, this woman, at a, I, I went to a party on Christmas Eve, and this woman and I were recommending things to each other. And she said, go see this movie called Dogtooth. It came out in 2009. It's the first oh, yeah. movie from Greece that's ever been nominated for an Oscar. Maybe the only movie uh, since. It's an incredible movie. I loved it. It's about 90 minutes long. It's about uh, parents who are kind of crazy, and they keep their children on their property. And they don't let them leave the property. They have this weird mythology they invent for why they can't leave the house. And at the time you join the movie, it's when the kids are old enough that they kind of start to rebel and things get weird. And it is just an insane, crazy movie. I loved it. And my favorite part of this is that this woman says, you know, I'm going to watch your special on Netflix this weekend. And I said, oh, I'm going to watch Dogtooth. And I thought, you know, she's going to text me and say, what she, tell me what she thought. And then I'll tell her what I thought of Dogtooth. I loved it. But I can't tell her first. You know what I mean? I can't be like, Dogtooth was great. Because then it's like I'm fishing for a compliment. But I have not heard from this woman in weeks. So I think she saw the special and was not a fan. She's probably more a Mulaney lady. My young love said to me, 
That was Brandon. That, was, that wasn't even a song. That was just Brandon interrupting. I asked him to play a song. He didn't have one ready. He panicked, and that was him. Uh, good job, Brandon. You impressed? Uh, I'm, I'm surprised. Okay. Yeah, that's, fair enough. That's as close as I get. I like that you're showing a different side of you, Brandon, that you're not afraid to be vulnerable. Hey, it's, it's what happens when you do this show for a while. You got to open up. Well said, Brandon. Well said. Chris Clemens is a player on the Jaguars. You probably don't know him. Used to be on the Seahawks. Uh, was a pass rusher for the Seahawks when they when they won the Super Bowl. He is part of our hot take of the week. Hot take. This week, uh, which is from Ryan O'Halloran of the Times Union uh, in Jacksonville. I believe it's called the Florida Times Union. And he sent out a tweet that got some attention this week uh, recapping a conversation he had with Mr. Clemens in the locker room. Clemens said to O'Halloran, while while with a group of reporters, you're the d- head of the group. And then Ryan responded to Chris Clemens, have fun getting cut. And, that, and this was just with no context. Out of the blue, he decides to put that up. Then, then Ryan O'Halloran follows up, and he says Clemens called the Jacksonville media racist, etc. And then he points out that Chris Clemens had no tackles, no stats at all that day. I don't really know what the take is. I guess the take is that the Jacksonville media is racist. The take, Ryan, o- Ryan O'Halloran's take is that Ryan O'Halloran, Ryan O'Halloran yep. is, like, is like a really clever, like cool guy. Like it's not okay. If he just said that, if he just said have fun getting cut and other people around him heard it, they'd be like, oh, that was kind of funny what he said. But when you tweet out like your own cool comeback, that's not cool. I don't like, uh, I don't like Ryan O'Halloran. And I would absolutely believe that uh, much like everyone else in Jacksonville, that the media is racist. Well, the whole tweet proved, you know, Chris Clemens's point. That's the part I didn't get. That was my immediate reaction to this: is that Chris Clemens thinks this guy's a dickhead, and so what he immediately does is be a dickhead by saying, "Have fun losing your job to Clemens," and I'm gonna send this out to everyone I know. We're definitely gonna have to bleep dickhead, aren't we? Probably, yeah. Yeah, such a slap move, Greg. That was our hot take of the week. God, I love that song. And you know what? I, I feel like I want to play the piano along to the song. Does that make sense? Like, that's what the song inspires in me, is to kind of add something to it. I think we each one of us can hear this song mm. and bring our own, bring our own instrument, bring our own take. <laughs> I want to hear your take on this question for Ask Anthony. Ooh, Ask Anthony. Timony Cricket. Uh, that's what he goes by. On, <laughs> that's a real on, name. Well, goes. that's his name on Twitter. At uh, Timmy Little Robot is his name, which is just as ridiculous. Is that a picture of Anthony in Gilmore Girls Episode 2 from Season 4? Oh. And with this uh, email, or tweet rather, he included a screen capture and there's some sort of wall in a Gilmore G- Girls episode where it has a bunch of people uh, that appear to have graduated from a high school. And one of those pictures is Anthony, a young Anthony Jeselnik with a tie on. Yes. It really was you. Yes. Uh, that, I'm, I'm so happy with this question. Uh, people, I've seen people on Twitter kind of bring this up, but no one's ever like directly asked me if that was me. It, it was episode of Gilmore Girls. I've never seen an episode of Gilmore Girls, but right when, that's, that's me at 22 years old. My first day of work, I, I moved out to Los Angeles from New Orleans. Came, came yeah, out right I was you. there. I we, li- yeah, we, li- we lived together. I was oh. in the car. Yeah, I mean, no, we drove out separately. We, we car- we, okay. I was driving behind you, if you remember. We had walkie-talkies, which you abandoned once you picked up your girlfriend <laughs> and would not talk to me in the walkie-talkie anymore, uh, which was depressing. This is really aging us that we had Wait, to have How long a- did you guys have walkie-talkies for? Well, because you, I mean, we had cell phones also, but if you're in a car, like we were following each other from – from Pittsburgh all the way to Los Angeles. So I was like, let's get walkie-talkies so we can just talk and let's pull over for gas. And it was, instead of having to call someone, you just pick it up and, pl- and do it. And it was really fun. We would make jokes. We had, we, remember we had a hilarious run of, we would do jokes. About, oh, I don't remember anything. Oh my God, this is so great. We, had, we would do jokes about, and we're so off topic now. We would do jokes about like, I, we would talk about how big our <laughs> were. 
<laughs> and I would just pull, we would just like we would just drive by this some like giant like some giant building and be like, Greg, see that thing? That's a big much. <laughs> we would laugh. We would laugh for hours doing this, and we, we had we really had fun doing it. And then we stop in Chicago and pick up Greg's girlfriend, and then drove the rest of the way with uh, with Ruth. And then you guys would not talk to me on the walkie-talkie anymore. I would keep talking to you, and you would never respond. It was uh, it was kind of sad. But then we we get to L.A., and the first thing I did, I didn't know what to do. And someone said, if you want to be an extra on TV shows or movies, you just go to this building. Yeah. You fill out a form. You tell them like what your height and weight and like your age is. They take a picture of you, and then every morning you call this hotline. Central casting. Central casting. I did it too. I did yeah. the West Wing. You did the West Wing, really? Oh, I did it right. one. I did one day, and it was so depressing, so awful. And I was like, "That's it." It's so sad. It's so awful. I did it. Tw I did two days in a row. I did for, my first day was Gilmore Girls, and I I didn't know what I was doing. I showed up, <laughs> and uh, I didn't bring a book or anything. I thought like, "Oh, I'm I'm going to work," and you just sit around all day with a bunch of other like nobodies who are doing nothing, <laughs> and uh, and then they they took my picture as I think that episode the Gilmore Girls go to Harvard to look at Harvard and the mom is looking at this wall of valedictorians and I'm one of the valedictorians and I can't believe that people pick me out of it but they really they're like oh that's Anthony Jessen like they really notice it now that it's on Netflix or DVD or something people tweet me a lot if um, this blew Emika my wife I, I guess I don't even say my wife anymore it blew her mind when I told her this because she has watched every Gilmore Girls episode four or five times. She never noticed you. And now she's like, I think I know what episode that is. I know what happened in that episode, but I don't remember that. I do remember you – or I don't remember, but you told me <laughs> that, that you made us watch this. Yeah, this is what's funny to me is that – uh, you don't remember that all that I was on it, but I remember specifically making everyone come over. Like it was you, Chris Nelson, a couple other people, and I was like, "Let's watch this and see where I am." Like I thought, this, "I'm in showbiz," and I would be like, "That's me." Like I would walk by a window and be like, "That's me," and you guys were like immediately were like, "Anthony, this is not fun. <laughs> it doesn't matter that that was you. No one cares. Stop this." Uh, my uh, my only other day of working as an extra was I was in the movie Pluto Nash. At the very end of the movie, you can kind of see me dancing with some girl like in a weird suit from the future like behind eddie murphy classic a depressing day and i remember the girl i had to dance with we kept talking in between takes and she was like you know you can actually make a lot of money as an extra if you become a sag member if you do enough of this that you get your sag card you get paid like four times as much and a lot of people just make their living like that and i went to go visit you at work where you worked for paul hall our old boss and i said paul i'm thinking about be being like a professional extra and he looked at me and said why the hell would you want to do that? And that was the last time I ever thought of it. Uh, and then I've never acted in anything since then. Um, that I hope that answers everyone's question. So that is me in Gilmore Girls. That was my first ever uh, taste of showbiz. I want to send this picture out because it's hilarious to see uh, you, you know, all dressed up as a valedictorian when you're 18. Our, I, was, uh, I was 22. 22, 22 years old. Well, you looked at 18. Yes. Listener of the week this week uh, is by the name U.S. Moto GP fans. This is on iTunes, of course. We encourage everyone to tell your friends uh, about the podcast if you like it. That's how we're going to grow. You can leave ratings, five stars or whatever. Leave a comment. It, helps, it all helps out. Our uh, favorite listener of the week says, The show's hilarious. Every week I'm surprised to see another episode posted. I can't believe it hasn't come crashing down yet. Who would have thought the soulless, monolithic NFL would let such an edgy, subversive podcast keep peeking out from behind the shield? Try to imagine Major League Baseball letting something like this to survive the episode, too. You can't do it. That's right. Baseball stinks. That's me. Uh, maybe the NFL has a soul after all. Who knew Roger Goodell was such a musical genius? Rock on. Hope it continues into the offseason. Go RGVP. And uh, that, that brings up a topic that, you know, you've been looking for the NFL to step up its game in terms of treating you right. We want to keep this show going. There's a little bit of a concern. We're here at the end that the Super Bowl could be the end of this podcast. We're all a little, you know, on edge about this right now. Oh, I'm not on edge at all. I'm, I'm sure of it. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, that we will last at the Super Bowl and then uh, and then I will uh, I will never step foot in the studio again. That was Sydney. That was Sydney, our co-producer, who Sydney got Carlson. got a little jealous that everyone was getting on the action with music, and Sydney decided, like, you know what? I can do it too. I can do anything the boys can do, only better. That's our Sydney. You turned uh, her bright red just now, by the way. Yeah. 
I uh, I can do that. Um, Play this I, again, for your, I, I was a little I was a little negative before about the definitely being done with this. The NFL could back up a truck and get me to come here. I've I've enjoyed uh, doing the podcast. Uh, I do not enjoy driving here. I do not enjoy. Well, how about if we uh, just send a truck or a, a a car to pick you up? That would be a start. That, that would be a, that would be a start, and I can't believe it hasn't happened already. It shows me how little power you actually have here at the network. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't have gotten that because I carry the shield. I carry it. Let's do predictions. Uh, this week, I have not, I've yet to repeat a bit on the show. Uh, this week, it was no exception. Uh, this week, I'm doing my predictions are couched in a segment I call Devil's Advocate. Mm. Greg is going to make his picks on the four wild card games this weekend, and I'm going to play Devil's Advocate. Uh, so, Greg, uh, go ahead. You start. Good role for you. You mm-hmm. once described your show as like a you know a late night show, as if it was this hosted by Satan. Yeah, I describe my stand up as if Satan did stand up. Uh, I just, when I go to the bathroom, it's as if Satan went to the bathroom. <laughs> I am gonna. When I take a shower, it's like Satan is bathing. <laughs> that was one too far. When I brush my teeth. <laughs> 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 now we're just making ourselves laugh. Let's talk about the first game of the week. Uh, we've called this the, the No Respect Bowl. No one believes in the Chiefs or the Texans. They are kind of the 11th and 12th team in the playoffs. Ten wins in a row and no one respects them. I love it. I respect the Chiefs. I think they're going to win this game. I think Alex Smith gets way too much credit. It's all about the defense, and there's no way they're letting Brian Hoyer and Jonathan Grimes score touchdowns. Chiefs get into the divisional round with win the game. All right. Let me play devil's advocate here. Parents shouldn't vaccinate their children. Children should vaccinate their parents. Houston wins. Turn down for clowny. <laughs> I'm going to take the Vikings against the Seahawks this week. I know that's a big-time upset. People just expect Seattle to walk in, destroy them. They beat them by 31 points a month ago, and they've played better since. So it really makes no sense uh, to take the Vikings, but that's what I'm going to do. Okay, let me play devil's advocate here. Uh, I think there should be a strict background checks for buying guns in this country. But if I pass the background check, I shouldn't have to buy the gun. Just give it to me. Free guns. It's in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Bible. Seattle on the road. Green Bay Packers head to Washington in a fascinating game. The Washington Post, talk about a bad hot take of the week. Asked the question this week, who would you rather have for the next five years, Kirk Cousins or Aaron Rodgers? Here's the answer. Kirk Cousins is going to get paid way too much by your lousy owner, and the Redskins are going to go back to the cellar, and the downfall is going to start this week when the Packers beat him. Give me a break. Cousins versus a guy who's won two MVPs. (laughs) I like the passion. Uh, Let me play devil's advocate here. If 18 is old enough to vote, smoke cigarettes, and die for your country, then it should be old enough to buy alcohol for 12-year-olds. Just saying. Washington wins in a squeaker. Uh, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh. This is really the big game of the week. It's on in prime time on Saturday night. We'll have to talk about where you're watching that game sometime later, but... Uh, Bengals Steelers. Everyone is picking the Steelers in this game. Everyone's saying this is the this is the sixth seed. You don't want to face the Steelers. Well, they haven't played very well the last two weeks. The Bengals are bound to win one of these years. They are 0 and seven, I believe, since they last won a playoff game. 0 and six under Marvin Lewis in the playoffs. This is a good roster. Let the Bengals have a win for once. Bengals get the victory. It's an upset at home. First, let me say, uh, I watch every single Steelers game alone by myself. I go so crazy. I get so... I embarrass myself that I can't even watch with other Steelers fans. I watch alone by myself. And this game scares me because Cincinnati is kind of due. Like, they haven't won... They haven't won a playoff game in t- 27 years? 25, 26 years? Yeah. Uh, it's something crazy that, I, that that's, frightens me. But let me play devil's advocate here. People who want a dog shouldn't get it from a dog breeder. They should go to a shelter and pay a homeless guy to act like a dog. Pittsburgh in a f-ing blowout. <laughs> that was Roger Goodell pushing a clown down the stairs. <laughs> now, Greg, before we go, uh, what uh, we haven't talked about them. How are my god kids? How are uh, how are Walker and Ellis? Your son and daughter. Walker is basically a vacuum cleaner. He's a wa- he's a little crawling vacuum cleaner. Everything that he sees, it's like Excuse all me? all he. Can-